Hello everybody, this is Jonathan Schrantz, and today I thought we would have a look at something a little bit fun here. I want to show you guys the top five most popular counter gambits. So if you don't know, in chess, a lot of the times, somebody, is usually white, will offer a gambit, and black, instead of refusing it, can actually offer another gambit in return, a counter gambit. So today we're going to have a look at five of the counter gambits that I think are actually very playable and a lot of club players might want to pick up on them. They're usually very aggressive and they lead to very interesting, exciting games. And a lot of the counter gambits out there, I was looking at a nice big long list. A lot of them are just dubious, they're just bad, there's some, some garbage out here. These five I do want to look at because I think they can be played, they have been played by good people. And we're going to start, as always, with number five. Number five on our list is the Winnowar Counter Gambit. So this is a very interesting line in the Slav for players that have this in mind. Here, white will most commonly play the move knight to f3, which cuts out on a little bit of the theory. But very often, you're going to see knight to c3, which looks like the most incredibly most natural move in the position. However, if a player does play this way, they need to be ready for a few more options. Obviously, black might just continue with knight f6, might even play a move like e6, but yeah, black needs to be ready for certain things, such as d takes c4, or the move that I want to show you guys here today, which is the move e5. So here, obviously, white has offered a pawn, and in return, black plays a counter gambit, and this is not that popular, but it's actually surprisingly interesting. You're going to get a very fascinating position, and I want to illustrate it with a game played between Michael Krasenkow versus Pridog Nikolic, and this was played in a, in a long standard tournament in Bled in, in 2002. So here, Black actually um, played a very model game and a very instructive little miniature. You don't see top players going down. Um, quite this easily all the time. But what is the point of this gambit? So they take on e5. We play the move d4. And after knight to e4, we can pick up the pawn by playing queen to a5 and then recapturing the pawn on e5. So after bishop to d2, black took on e5, asking that knight to move away, and now just followed up with a nice simple move, knight to f6, developing the stuff. And yeah, a couple more moves, knight f3, Queen d6, the queen's got to go somewhere. We get to a position where it's really not that easy for white to play the move e3. It's certainly a possibility, but if you do want to play a move like e3, possibly black will simply take, and if you take with a bishop, which isn't necessarily the only move, maybe you can take with a pawn just to keep the queens on the board, um, it's not so obvious that white will be able to get a big advantage. Maybe white has a little something, but after here and here, you're going to have to block with something. We're going to see a lot of trades yeah, it's probably a little something for black, but I'm pretty sure that um, the players with the the white pieces would prefer to try to get some sort of an advantage. And the way white does it in the game is the most popular move. I have left the database over here for you guys to check out. I'll also leave a link to the study if you guys want to check out these games a little bit deeper. But we are using the, the master database here on Leechess, so um, that's kind of what we based the popularity on. And... Yeah, so he plays queen to c2, just keeping queens on the board. White's going to castle long. Black's probably going to play bishop e7 and castle on the king side, which means we're going to get an interesting, sharp game. And a lot of the times, that's why you're playing the counter gambit. You want something that's a little bit murky with chances for both sides that um, is going to be just a little bit unclear about what's going on. So if you're into that kind of play, this is a gambit you might want to check out. And here, e3 is the most popular move, so we see the opposite side castling takes, and white now makes an interesting decision. There's a lot of ways to do it, possibly, uh, you'd consider. I think the most natural, I think, to a lot of people is, well, you just take it back with the bishop. You don't ruin your pawn structure. You can tell the most popular move, actually, is f takes, um, with the idea of putting this bishop on this diagonal. So this does feel like a very good diagonal for the bishop. So potentially, you can imagine a lot of people wanting to put the bishop on uh, c3, where it'll have a lot of pressure on the king side. But, uh, yeah, if you do put the bishop over here, obviously we're going to have to move the queen away, but then possibly with the bishop gone, we're going to be able to harass it. Knight a6 to b4 is going to be on uh, it's going to be on black's radar. So here, bishop to c3 was played. This is a discovered attack on the queen. The queen backed up, and white now takes back the pawn. So the white structure is a little bit weaker than black. Black's all of their pawns are quite intact. Here, 
White has a third island and a, and a target, you know, you can imagine. Knight to g4, you can imagine an eventual rook to e8. There are some uh, some targets here. Now, the, let's see, black followed up with knight to a6. This seems very logical. The knight is going to b4 to harass the queen. So a3 was played, and now knight to g4 attacking the e3 pawn. You gotta do something about it also. You don't, depending on where the queen is. We have forking potential uh, in the future, but white just kind of stops all this with rook to e1, having to move the rook behind the pawn. And now the move g6. Interesting move, kind of seeing in the future that the bishop and queen will be lined up here, taking away some squares from this knight, and just preparing to play the move like bishop f6 and get some stuff traded here. After b4, logically restricting the movement of the knight, this knight was kind of hoping to go into c5 and maybe play a5, but never quite got the time. Black played bishop to f6, and after h3, the game is actually over. This is, is a big oversight by the opponent. You'll notice there are some loose pieces here, and black actually can make the most of this. You can pause your video if you want to solve it, but black goes on to win the game after bishop takes c3. Okay, attacking the rook, so the queen took back here. But now, knight f2, attacking the rook, attacking the knight on g3. So, yeah, it was a very interesting opening. Obviously not the only way to play this, but hey, if you are looking for something against the Slav, this is a very interesting counter gambit that you definitely should take a look at. We are now gonna move on to the fourth most popular counter gambit. This is the Von Henning Schara Gambit, sometimes known as the Von Henning Schara Counter Gambit. It really is a counter gambit, and let's take a look. I have a, I've been a fan of this one for a while. It's in the Queen's Gambit Declined, and now after Knight to C3, we play a Tarash with the idea that after the most popular move, C takes D5. We don't recapture right away on D5. We instead take on D4, attacking the knight and asking white for some clarification. Are you going to take right away? Are you going to play queen to A4 check? And both lines have the potential to transpose into one another. Queen A4 possibly uh, avoids some of the variations. So for example, the main line is queen A4 and after bishop to D7, the recapture, we take now and develop our knights. There are some alternative options if the queen does take here that you should know about. Um, one idea is we exploit this pin, and after they go back here, based on this the way this has been played, since we haven't wasted a turn on bishop to d7, black can consider other alternatives like bishop to e6, attacking the queen, and trying to play a position like this where knight to b4 might be coming very quick and asking some questions of how you want to defend um, which is another interesting variation. It's also kind of interesting that you sack a pawn and you allow the uh, you allow the queens to be traded, but it's very dangerous, which is why most people, including um, the players in this game between Braun and Nisipianu, uh, decided to play the move queen a4 first. Either way, we're gonna get a very similar position. So after bishop takes d7, the queen takes back on d4. Now we take the pawn, and when they take with the queen, you can actually play knight to f6 here, gambiting the b7 pawn, but most players prefer knight to c6, defending the pawn and just preparing knight f6 next, kick the queen back, and probably black is actually going to castle queenside, something like bishop c5, queen e7, castles long, we're going to get a nice exciting position. So, uh, after knight f3, knight f6, the queen returns to d1, and after bishop c5, e3, queen e7, um, a3 was played in this game. Most players are preferring to develop the bishop and castle first, but uh, we get a very similar position to what you might expect, where a3 and b4, and sometimes white can even after black castle's queenside, just play b4 without a3. So it might even be a little bit slow to play a3, because after castles, queen c2 looks normal, eyeballing the black king. Most players are going to play king b8 here, just getting off that c file immediately, but g5 was the move of choice, and this is just going to be very typical. Black's idea is to get a big attack on the king side, you know, after bishop e2 and castles, we want to be ready to play moves like g4, h5, typical king side attack. And meanwhile, we'll see in just a moment how these pieces operate in a position like this. Because after bishop e2, g4 was played, kicking the knight back, and now king to b8. Here, b4 was played, 
seems to make a lot of sense to me. And after the bishop decides to stay on this diagonal, knight to c4, bishop c7, we see this all the time in this kind of position. The bishop gets on the long diagonal here, white is still waiting to castle, and now this move, knight to e5, which is a very typical move. It also not only offers a couple trades to, which is fine, um, it also, knight e5 uh, hints at the idea of making the c6 square available for the bishop. The bishop will do very well on this diagonal, asking, uh, putting a lot of pressure on the white king side, and also maybe the rook will be coming over to c8, just kind of eyeballing the queen over here. So after knight takes e5, the bishop took back, and white finally decides to castle. Rook c8 played, and now h5. So we're going to see. It's going to be an interesting attack. Uh, you do kind of like it as black. You actually feel like this has gone relatively according to plan for black. There's two on two, so not an easy way for white to necessarily break through. But obviously, both sides need to be very careful. Um, and here, yeah, a fascinating move was played. G3, I really like this move. The idea is if you take, and let's pretend you take with the H-pawn, because this would be the most natural way to do it, then just h4, and it's going to be black breaking through, and white could get himself into a little bit of trouble, which is why f3 was played. This obviously has uh, <laughs> does weaken the e3 square, and in the game, black followed up with h4, missing a really amazing opportunity. So if you haven't spotted it, you can feel free to pause and test your tactical ability here. This is something that would have been really cool had Black found it. And the idea that was missed is Bishop takes c3. I don't think, this probably isn't what was missed. But after here, taking on e3, check, king h1. Now comes the very impressive move that wasn't played in the game. But the impressive move that could have been played is knight to g4. And this has the idea of, if you don't take me, I'm hopping into f2, and that's just going to be a disaster. And if you do take me, I'm opening the h file, which is also going to be a disaster. For example, um, not the best move, but if they play here, simply, we are going to sacrifice, open up this diagonal, and the king suddenly gets checkmated. White can actually block with a couple of the pieces, but he's not going to last very long. So after knight takes g4... If they do end up taking and you take back, perhaps the best would be to take here, which does expose the queen, but now we're just going to take here, threatening mate again, and after this check, you kind of run into a wall, you run into a dead end here, there's just going to be no way of stopping black from delivering a mate very soon. So, yeah, this could have been played, um, he could have, instead of playing h4, taken the knight, taken on e3 and sacrifice the knight with knight g4. In the game, h4 was played, and now white tries to get nice and cozy, tries to lock it up, and this doesn't really seem like the kind of position Nisipiano strives for. I've seen a couple of his games. He really likes these. You lock up the king side, and the white king, you'll notice, he gets kind of trapped over there a little bit later in the game. Uh, now followed up with bishop takes c3, and after the recapture, doesn't take on e3 right away, tosses in this clever little bishop to a4, um, attacking the queen. The rook's behind the queen, so the queen needs to move away. And now after we take on e3, the bishop on c3 is hanging. This is also nice because it forces that king into the corner. And after some trades here, we get a very interesting endgame. And after b5, which is probably the first inaccuracy, we're going to see an excellent example here of a knight versus bishop endgame. So if you're a big fan of endgames, uh, you will really appreciate this one. There's a little bit of difference in the king's safety, and you might be thinking, where can the knight go? We start dreaming of ideal squares. This knight would love to be somewhere like f2, um, or maybe he can get to e3 with the idea of following it up with a pawn all the way to f4 to support the knight up there. This bishop is probably dreaming, and won't let me pick him up, but he's probably dreaming of somehow getting to this diagonal where there might be some pressure here. You can imagine a queen and a bishop trying to line up on that b7 pawn. And yeah, this is the first inaccuracy. This does allow the knight to start hopping around. So knight to d5. Notice that you can't take the knight with the rook because there might be some back rank issues. Um, so instead, the queen centralized makes a lot of sense. But yeah, the knight does get hopping. And after the rook moves away, f5, attacking the queen with the idea that after the queen moves, 
the pawn is going to f4. So black has achieved uh, quite a bit over there on the king side. The knight has improved. The bishop still needs to find a way to get into the game, ideally to e4, but there might be some issues with getting there, as we're going to see later on in this game. So the bishop starts this maneuver. Um, this would this is kind of a loose piece. This is kind of a loose piece. If the queen moves away, gets off the diagonal, you can imagine there could be some forking opportunities. So both sides kind of using a little bit of tactics to improve the pieces. But now after queen to c7, um, offering a queen trade, white politely declines and rook to d8. So here is where some calculation is going to be required. This is a sacrifice. The white queen could potentially take on h4, but it, uh, it might not be the best idea to go for that pawn. First of all, this pawn is not really threatening to run, not with this king being as weak as he is and the big pieces on the board, but also there could be some issues, as we'll see in the game, when the queen does move far away, there could be some tactical issues. And here, the opponent decided to play bishop to e2, which is probably correct. If bishop to e4, you can pause your video if you want to try to figure out what the issue is here. There is actually an issue on g2, so this would allow the very nice move, knight takes g2. So tactically, he has prevented bishop from e4 from happening. If you take with the king, this is going to just be a simple mate and two. After rook to d2, uh, you can't go back because of here, and you can't go here because of here. So this is leading to checkmate. You won't be able to do it this way. And if you take with the rook, well, now we are going to come in here, force you to block with the rook, and the queen is going to sneak in, and she should be able to deliver checkmate very quickly. So, yeah, black has done well, avoiding bishop coming to e4. And now, after another knight hop, kind of encouraging the queen to take on h4. Um, white does take, which is wrong. Uh, possibly you should find some way of preventing black's next maneuver, but it's not so easy to see from a distance. But the idea is put the knight on the ideal square, which right now would be f2. And he gets there by going to c3 and uh, now going to d1 and eventually will be going to f2. Now we're on the next turn. Now after bishop to f7, rook to c8, bishop to d5 is a nice, clever little trick by white, um, <laughs> possibly allowing black to slip up here. Black did not slip up. Black uh, gave this check. If you do take the bishop, this actually will be a mistake because now white will be able to make the position murky by giving this check and then taking this pawn. So yeah, probably the piece is better than three pawns, but this really is not clear anymore. So instead, black gave this check and only now played knight to d3, which wins the game, and the opponent did resign. Both of the pieces are hanging, the rook, the bishop, also queen b6 looks like a pretty nasty threat. So yeah, an excellent illustration of once the we got to that end game of black just outplaying the opponent, and I think this one is a very fascinating gambit. I've played it quite a few times myself, so if you do want to give it a try, test out the Von Henning Shara and let me know how it goes for you. We are now going to head to the third most popular counter gambit. This is the Falk Bear counter gambit. So when it comes to the King's Gambit here, there's actually quite a lot of counter gambits that I could have picked, but by far the most popular is responding to the King's Gambit with the move D5. And after the recapture, it's actually really tricky. There's a lot going on here. There's actually quite a few options, even in this initial position. And I'm actually kind of surprised in this database that E takes F4 is uh, the most popular move. Um, in, a, in another database that has a few more games than this, E4 is the most popular move. So I'm kind of always accepted that as the main line. We won't get too much into it. Um, and maybe there'll be a video at some point coming about the Falk Bear Counter Gambit, because it is really fascinating and there's kind of a lot of choices. C6 is also a move, and probably not a good move, but queen takes d5 has also been played a few times. But to my mind, the most principled way of continuing here is with the move e4. So we've gambited a pawn just to get this nasty thorn pawn. We kind of see this as a recurring theme in a lot of these counter gambit videos, is you want to get this kind of thorn pawn, make it hard for white to develop the knight, hard to move the pawn. Um, and for this one, this is a romantic opening. When it comes to the King's Gambit, you have to look at a game from Paul Morphy. 
And this is the game John William Shulton versus Paul Morphy. It was played in New York in 1857. And as far as I can tell, there's some dispute as to whether or not this game was played blindfolded or not. But either way, it's a fantastic example. It's a classic Morphy game of one side developing all the pieces and getting a huge initiative. The other side not getting the stuff out fast enough, being greedy, and getting punished immediately. So if you haven't seen this game, it is definitely worth checking out. So after knight c3, knight f6, these seem like very logical continuations. After d3, black decides to play bishop to b4, pinning the knight, trying to maintain control over that e4 square. Okay, bishop d2 breaks the pin, and now a classic Morphe move. It's actually the most popular move, um, but I don't know if he had a database back then. And he just pawned to e3. It's just crazy. Okay, he's going to try to win some more time, he's clearing some lines, he's making this bishop move again, and now he simply gets on with castling, the rook is going to come to e8, and he's going to try to get pressure as fast as he can, this is like just classic Morphe here. So after the bishop had to waste a little bit more time running back, uh, he actually took, nowadays the most popular move is rook to e8, but it's probably going to be very similar after b takes, rook e8, bishop e2, we now see him try to get as much pressure against this bishop as possible. And he starts with bishop to g4, and white needs to somehow break uh, the pin here in a moment. But first, he just tries to keep the pawn a little bit greedy. This move might be possible, um, but after the move c6, really, this is too much. Now he's gone too far. Taking on c6, trying to keep absolutely all the stuff is just wrong. White somehow needs to get on with development, get castled, have a sense of danger here. Um, but it would also be kind of admitting that c4 is at least a minor mistake. But yeah, this is too much, too compliant, and now the pieces are coming in and it is too late. White did try to play the move king to f1. Perhaps you might be thinking some move like knight to f3, doesn't that develop the stuff? Doesn't that kind of break the pin? Well, not really, because now I think we could just take here and play knight to d4, and you're going to have huge problems on the e2 square. So instead of knight to f3, he tried the move king to f1, but simply sacking on e2, typical Morphe. Uh, he takes back with the knight, knight d4 comes, and white is just busted here. White has a, it's just a hard time keeping the king safe now. So queen to b1 is what was tried. This breaks the pin. Maybe the queen will somehow sneak in, but never really going to get the time. Bishop takes e2. The king is running up. Knight to g4. <laughs> Doesn't look good. And now a beautiful move. You can, you can pause. You might even see it on the screen. But the beautiful move Morphe played here was knight to f3. And yeah, this is just a king hunt. So he just calculated from here. This is going to lead to a checkmate. Um, after the recapture, queen to d4 king is trying to sneak out but you just chase the king up the board and i think here according to some sources they say white resigned so probably what happened was uh, they did some analysis of how the game would have ended and um, but some sources give the conclusion of the game as knight to h6 followed by the check and queen to h5 a beautiful game by Morphe, by no means a comprehensive look at the Falk Pier counter gambit, but if you're looking for something against the, the King's Gambit, this is a very interesting way to do it, and there's more than one line. So after you uh, enter a position like this, you actually have some choices. You can take on f4, you can play c6, which is another interesting gambit. There's a lot of lines to look at if you're curious, but hopefully you did enjoy that Morphe game. And now we'll move on to what, at least in my mind, is the most popular counter gambit. When I think of a counter gambit, the first thing that pops into my mind is the Albin counter gambit. Uh, one of the first counter gambits I learned, and there's actually an expert player in my area who plays this regularly, so I kind of have had a look at it for both sides. I think it's very fascinating, and actually doing a little bit of research for this video, I kind of discovered that maybe it'd be interesting to make a video just on the Alvin Counter Gambit. So let me know in the comments below if there's one of these Counter Gambits you really like. Let me know, and maybe I'll make a full video on it, just covering it a little bit more in depth. Um, but here, the point of this Gambit, uh, Counter Gambit, is after they take on e5, you can play the move d4, where basically every game is going to go knight f6, knight c6, and white will choose between three moves. However, there is the opportunity to fall, to trap somebody. This can be the famous Lasker trap after e3. 
Um, so a lot of people will know it. But after bishop to d4, you can play this nice little continuation after they take, you take on e3. Or white should really be cautious. White should take back on e3 and accept that the position is just worse for him. But most players are going to take if they've come this far. And the main idea was taking on f2. Where again, white might think they can outfox you by keeping connection to the queen. Obviously, the king took the pawn, they were going to lose the queen. But now you make a knight, so not recapturing the king right away, but promoting with check. And here again, the king needs to like move back to e1 and kind of admit that you're super lost. Um, a lot of the people, though, fall for the trap. They're going to go here. It gets even worse because bishop to g4 just totally wins the queen. And now the game is over. So there's that little trap that a lot of players know about, but still, a lot of beginning players will fall for. And if you know somebody knows what they're doing, they're going to play knight f3, knight c6. And it's very interesting. Now white will choose between three moves. Um, and my personal preference has always been to play the move a3 here, which just takes away any of these nasty bishop b4 checks. You'll never fall for the trap. You have nothing to worry about. And it also plans b4 followed by bishop to b2 in the future trying to get some pressure against the d4 pawn. Uh, another option is knight to d2, and the point of this move is to play knight to b3 and attack this pawn. Black can respond by protecting the pawn. Knight to e7, knight to f5. It's very interesting. Um, the most popular move is actually the move g3, which just simply says, you made it hard for me to play e3. Okay, I will develop my bishop this way. I'll castle. I'm up a pawn. I'm feeling good, and we'll take it from there. And our first game actually features this main line there's no more famous person at playing the Alvin Counter Gambit than Alexander Morozevich. So this is his game. He was playing uh, Boris Gelfand, who had the white pieces, against Morozevich, who had the black pieces. And this was a blindfold game that we know for certain. This was from the Amber Blind Tournament. Here, after g3, um, knight g to e7 was played. You'll notice, uh, you look at the, take a look at the database, there are quite a few moves that... The white player needs to know, so it can be a good weapon because there's actually quite a bit of options that white needs to be prepared for. Morozevich just plays the normal plan, which is to remaneuver the knight to g6 and simply going to collect the e5 pawn, get the pawn back, and just say, I'm going to get my pieces out. I have a little bit of extra space. I got my pawn on d4. I'm feeling good. White now will choose between castling or the move played in the game, which is bishop to g5. And you'll notice here, he does not trade the bishops if you do play bishop to e7, perhaps white will be able to trade, and perhaps white will be able to pick up the d4 pawn without uh, much of a hassle. So the black queen stays connected to the d4 pawn, has to put the queen in front of the bishop, you can argue that's a good thing, but he's going to follow it up with h6 soon, which is indeed what happens. Castles, h6, bishop to f4. And the follow-up here is very interesting. He grabs the bishop, okay, nothing too controversial there, and now plays this nice move, g5. So trying to tear down the pawn structure, trying to open up some files towards this white king, and just trying to remove this f4 pawn so that the e pawn becomes a little bit weaker. So all in all, a very excellent move and a very typical Morozevich move. White decides to take this time, doesn't do anything with the f pawn, Let's black open the file and now maneuvers the knight into e4 where it's staring at the f6 square. Black decides to defend it. And now the g file is open, so it's going to get a little bit chaotic. We're going to see the black queen is going to come in. Possibly the rook can come to the g file. Uh, in the game, the pawn was attacked, developing the queen, attacking the pawn. And black now goes for queen to g4, defending the pawn and threatening to bring the rook to the g file with a nasty attack, so white has to get off the g-file. And now, bishop to f5, a very nice move, attacks the knight, develops a piece, and, uh, you know, prepares to castle or to play rook to d8. So here, white actually uh, takes on d4. This is fine, and an interesting decision. Castling is probably okay, but maybe he's worried about the pawn structure being shattered with knight takes c6. Just plays rook d8. The king is fairly safe in the center and could always run to f8 if he was forced. But now, um, the blunder of the game. I think white was probably looking at this position thinking that um, he just wants to change it. It looks pretty good for black. Black just has a lot of pressure. And he decides to make it complicated by sacrificing a queen here for some amount of material, making it murky, making it kind of blurry. 
but it just simply doesn't work. So at this point, after taking the queen, um, black is now just totally winning. The game continued with knight takes e7. He simply took back, allowed black to take here, and the rest of the game for Morzevich actually was fairly clean, so we'll just take a look from here. Black is now winning this game, and um, yeah. Some moves were played, and he just kind of stabilized. He trades a little bit, gets all of his pawns on good squares, and after the e-pawn just fell, Gelfand actually resigned here, so yeah, very interesting illustration. I think this is one that can frustrate a lot of uh, a lot of D4 players, so if you're looking for something interesting. And just talking about Morozevich, I came here, and I actually, there was so many Morozevich games that we could do, so potentially in the future I might make a video on how to use somebody as a guide for studying an opening. I think maybe that'd be an interesting topic. Let me know in the comments below. And with that in mind, we will now move on to what surprised me as being the most popular gambit, uh, counter gambit. It does make sense, but I didn't see the Blumenfeld coming, but this is actually the most popular gambit. And I can tell you, as a D4 player, this is one that I've been surprised with before. It's one that I think a lot of D4 players might be underprepared for. Um, I even know some relatively high rated players who have been just totally shocked that this actually appeared in a real game. It can be a big surprise. And the most common way of reaching it is probably via knight f6, c4, e6, and after knight to c3, playing c5, now d5, b5. And you might be thinking, hey, why is this a counter gambit? I don't think white ever really offered something. Well, another way that this could be reached is via the Banco gambit. So here after c5, d5, here is a true gambit. White can offer the c pawn right back. So this is a gambit, you know, we're offering the c pawn. And now after e6, we have a true counter gambit. However you get there, I think this is actually also a very good idea, a good weapon for people that are looking for something after um, knight to f3 here. So I think a lot of people, when they play knight f6, they play e6. They're really hoping for a nimzo, you know, you're just going to pin them. But maybe they play knight f3 and maybe you've shopped around. Maybe the, the queen's Indian is not really for you. Maybe the queen's gambit declined is not up your alley. Maybe the bogo Indian just doesn't appeal for you and you're looking for something else. Well, the alternative is to play c5 and almost all true uh, d4 players, they're going to play the move d5 here. Of course, you better be ready for all sorts of stuff if you do play this way. But it gives you this opportunity to play the move b5 here and play this very interesting counter gambit. And the main move before we turn our, our interest to the, the game that we're going to look at is the move bishop to g5. Most people are going to develop and there's tons and tons and tons of room to explore and be creative here and if this isn't enough to shock your opponent you probably can find a line somewhere that will be very interesting i've seen people play all sorts of crazy stuff here um, in these positions as black but the main 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 line is to take solidify your pawns we're going to see a position like this where you can actually play the surprising move here um, bishop to e7 we're now threatening to take on e4 so black is usually taking here giving the b-pawn um, just to gain some time. You can imagine some position like this is the absolute main line. And yeah, it probably is a little bit better for white. Taking a quick glance around at all the black pieces. This guy is a little bit stuck out here. Possibly not the, not the best piece. All the other pieces seem to make a little bit of sense. Pass pawn, but you know, maybe white will ever be able to construct f4 and e5, this kind of pawn break. This will, of course, make this guy suddenly look pretty good if he actually has a target. Yeah, so all in all, maybe white is slightly better here, but maybe this is the main line and this is the best that white can do. This should be a playable gambit. So we return, though, back to where we were after the move b5. And I want to showcase a game here between Sigbert Tarash and Alexander Alakine, which was played in 1922. This was an excellent game by Alakine. Uh, really model game for how to use the center and get an easy attack in this game the second most popular move you can see the amount of games there there's still over 700 games played so this will be a very popular way but white just fully concedes the center for the pawn so this is kind of what you're hoping for if you play this gambit you really want to take this game kind of as the model for what you would really like to do in this game uh e3 was played after the bishop comes to the center knight to c3 
castles bishop b2 here we have an example of same side castling um where black though is just going to have the center b3 is a very nice move you know if i have to protect my pawn with a4 in the future i'll be able to but mostly bishop is going to b2 um, so white doesn't castle right away but eventually he will get there and <laughs> kind of typical alakine fashion i like this you know very patient not in any rush. Yeah, we're down a pawn, but let's just put the rooks in the middle, and then we're going to play e5, and then we're going to play e4, and these pawns are just going to get going here. He lets white do whatever he wants, but now e5, and after rook e1, e4, and this pawn is actually a huge problem here for white, because now there's no real defenders over here of the king, so the knights start coming in. Knights are coming to g4. Uh, once the knights come in here, the queen's coming in, we get, might get some pressure here on the f-pawn. So a lot to worry about as white tries this move knight d1. But this is, in fact, already just losing. White Black is going to have a, a massive attack here. So starts with this. Um, there's some attack here on the h-pawn. Knight f1, trying not to create some weaknesses, was played. And an interesting move, queen to g5. Um, when I first saw this for the first time, I thought maybe the queen would go to h4. But she does a very good job on g5, as we'll see, because this knight is going to get booted, but it's just going to redirect. The knight is coming to h4, um, so not putting the queen there, but reserving the h4 square for the knight is black's very interesting idea, and it turns out to work very well. Not easy for white to come up with anything, and <laughs> just the center, just bushes, so absolutely fantastic. Uh, temporarily shutting out the bishop. Also, this pawn is just going to go to d3. And just a monster center for black. Um, so right here, white was kind of coaxing the pawn forward because um, maybe there's some threats here of taking on d4. So the white actually encourages the center to move so that after some check, he'll be able to put the bishop back on b2. But uh, black carries on. And here, plays the move knight to g3, where capturing would be absolutely... Uh, just absolutely lost after we take back with the queen. Not going to be easy to defend against checkmate. So <laughs> king to g1. And I'm laughing because I know how black is going to torture the opponent in the future. <laughs> Keep an eye on how many times that knight just really bothers the black king. Um, okay, so here, a pawn attacked. Check. <laughs> and after defends the a pawn, uh, white is coming in. White is also thinking of playing, just trying to break through, but this is all very slow. Um h5 a very useful move we'll see why in just a minute not only is he getting some some left on the back rank but the pawn will do well on h4 we will see why in a second b6 yeah you're breaking through okay here comes the knight again poking at that black king um, after he takes back throws in another check and uh yeah just torturing the guy and here though decides to play for a win because uh, of course why would you not plays the move d2 attacking the rook nowhere for the rook to go so rook to f1 and at least you can say well i got that pesky knight out of there but it shouldn't be any comfort because black just continues to make threats bishop to e6 just threatening to take this h pawn is going to be too strong there's not enough defense over there by the white king so after king h1 he simply takes anyway threatening mate after the recapture rook to f3 you can see how it's fallen apart knight g3 remember that h pawn Pawn to h4. Just fantastic. And <laughs> black tries to throw a bishop away in order to get some sort of really small counterplay. But it's not going to be enough here. And you don't have to worry about this threat. You just take on h3, ending the game. So, yeah, really fantastic and a very good surprise weapon. Um, you might want to check out the Blumenfeld gam the counter gambit because it's actually the most popular counter gambit available. It's a very good one, and I think you actually will take a lot of people that are really well prepared for the Benoni, really well prepared for the Banco, but you bust out the Blumenfeld and a lot of people might be surprised by this one. So thank you guys for watching. Let me know in the comments below what other kind of gambits, counter gambits, what are you guys into? Maybe I can make a video on it. And yeah, if you haven't already, please do subscribe to the channel. It helps me out a ton. And hit like, share it around, um, let your friends know. I will include a link to the study so you'll be able to go there. You'll be able to check out all of the games in detail, analyze them for yourselves, check with the database, and see if any of these appeal to you. Thank you, guys.